Hello, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the second day of the Future of Citizen Science, sharing experiences from the European Community Conference. Um, for those of you who were not with us yesterday, my name is uh, Marzia Mazzonetto, and together with my colleague Michael Creek, uh, we are facilitating uh, this conference. Uh, we are both from Sticky Dot, which is a company based in Brussels and focused to supporting citizen engagement uh, with science through co-creation and participatory approaches. Um, as you probably know, this conference is organized jointly by the um, EU Citizen Science and Action Projects. Uh, these two projects are both financed by the European Commission under the Horizon 2020 work program. Uh, both projects uh, strongly focus on citizen science uh, and both projects uh, provide um, a, a great variety of tools, uh, resources uh, and uh, great examples uh, that can be useful to the citizen science community in the future. The reason why this conference is very important for both of them uh, to showcase what they have developed, but also to interact with all of you uh, to be able to discuss about how these uh, resources can be useful to you, uh, how it can be adapted to your specific context, and so therefore better understand how the legacy of these projects can be enhanced. Uh, today, as, as we did yesterday, you will have a nice mix of um, panel presentations, but also uh, a lot of opportunities to interact uh, with the speakers um, that will be uh, talking today. Um, we will also have a satellite event uh, in the afternoon, uh, but I will let my colleague Mike will tell you more about this right away as long as uh, some housekeeping tips and other practical information. So I hand over to you, Michael. Thanks very much, Marzia. Yeah, a real pleasure to again see so many people. There was a great atmosphere yesterday um, throughout the session. So I'm looking forward to seeing that same energy today, although we're getting there little by little this morning. Um, so uh, we're starting today, uh, we'll start with a little warm up, um, but then at 10 past, uh, we'll welcome Lyndon Farrer from the European Commission uh, to talk about a commission perspective on citizen science and societal engagement. Um, the session following that at 10.30 is on the added value of citizen science. And there we look at uh, assessment of our impact. Um, at 10 past 11, uh, we move for a coffee break. Um, there we'll open up the social rooms so we can have a coffee together and a bit of a chat and be able to see each other, not only the speakers. And at 11.30, it's time to set off on our tour of Europe. Uh, we'll be hearing from seven different countries across Europe uh, about the initiatives they've been working on. Uh, at 12 o'clock, we get out uh, not only our crystal ball, but also our fish bowl um, for a participatory conversation about the future of citizen science, looking ahead. And we'll wrap things up um, at 12.40 uh, before letting you free for lunch. Before we come back together at 2 o'clock uh, for our high-level policy event this afternoon. So we look forward to, to seeing you there. A few practical tips about how to get around in Hopin if you weren't here yesterday. Uh, right now you're on the you're in the stage. And there's also the sessions area. We will direct you there. Um, yeah, for the when when you we have uh, some of the sessions that take place there. Um, so you'll be able to see, as you can see, stage live at the moment, but uh, later on sessions will be live as well. Uh, we also have our expo area. This was live yesterday. We had uh, a, a really nice uh, tour of the booths in the expo space. Uh, but if you missed it, you can still go back and have a look for more information about all the different projects and initiatives uh, there in the expo. Uh, so again, that's on the left-hand column. Um, as well as the expo, we also have, uh, so during the coffee break, we will open up the networking area. Uh, this, you don't see it at the moment, but it will appear also in that left-hand column. And this is where you can be paired up with another conference participant for a three-minute chat. Um, yeah, it's a nice way to uh, meet some new people uh, from across our community. And during the coffee break, we'll also open up the social room. You'll find that in sessions. And there again, it's a chance just to have a chat over a coffee. Uh, remember as well that you can uh, 
send private messages to people and also schedule one-on-one -on -one meetings within Hopin. You, there's a sort of a video conferencing facility where you can set up a private conversation. Uh, to do that, uh, click on people uh, under event on the right, and uh, you can search and find anybody and click schedule a meeting or send them a message to get in touch. If you're struggling a bit with Hopin, no problem. Uh, you can find our colleague Andrea Nicolai, uh, and you can find Andrea in the private chat if under event on the right and people search for Andrea. Uh, there was lots of action. Uh, it was nice and lively on Twitter yesterday, and we're hoping to see that again today. Please use the hashtag future of CS 2021. And you can follow uh, the handles at action for CS and at EU SITSAI project um, to keep up with what's going on in the sessions. Um, so yeah, that's all on the practical side. Um, back over to you, Martia, for a, a quick warm up. Thank you, Michael. So um, for those of you who were here yesterday, you learn how to type uh, emojis uh, in the chat. If you were not here, don't worry, I'm going to explain it right away. Um, we would like to still make use of the uh, emojis to um, yeah, get a bit of a feeling of how is it going today. Um, so my first question would be, how do you, how are you feeling today? Uh, maybe a bit tired from a uh, long day yesterday, but uh, we hope you still have a lot of energies to, to work with us today. Um, so to do the emojis, uh, it's really simple. You have to type a colon uh, and then write a word, uh, any word, and then um, uh, usually hoping uh, we'll associate it with an emojis. So here is an example. If you want to do a smiley face, if you that type, a colon followed by smile, then an emoji, a smiley emoji will uh, appear in the chat. So to, to, to do so, you can use the main chat uh, of the stage. There are two chats. There is one that is the main chat of the whole events and one of uh, the, um, the stage. So please use the chat uh, that we have here within the stage. And I'm really curious through your emojis to understand how uh, you're feeling today. And as always, there will be in some interpretation needed because I see <laughs> unicorns and ducks. So I'm yes. guessing, <laughs> again, that's also a good sign as um, yesterday we had cats and other type of animals. So yeah, Federico is ready for Christmas. Great Indeed. to see. <laughs> Lucy, is that a swimming otter? I didn't even know that emoji. I guess, yes, it looks like someone is already dancing. Mm -hmm, that's nice. Silk, I need a, a, a mouse uh, and a, a love letter. What do you, <laughs> what oh, you Oh, this about? one I know, Silk, your love for mice. <laughs> ah, okay. Um, a, a some, sloth this morning, yeah. Yeah, a I can relate to that more than to the dancing. I think I need yeah, more. Yeah, John's already dancing. <laughs> yeah. Nice. I see emojis are working quite nicely today, too. Let's see if a few more yeah. come up. If you don't manage to get an emoji, you can just write a word, of course. Um, no worries. If not, we know, have okay. a few more warm-ups for you to, to be fully awake for our first presentation. So I hand over again to you, Michael. Although I was thinking, shall we just move straight on? I think, uh, uh, maybe just one more would be good. Okay, let's do a quick one. So we have a word association game uh, we can play with you. Um, so I want you to type in the chat uh, the first word that comes to mind uh, when I show you the word morning. Uh, what's the first the first word you think of? We have a 10 second delay on hopping. So if it looks like we're a bit slow, that's not just the morning. That's uh... <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, we'll start to see those. Okay, coffee. Yeah. Okay, Claudia's on the tea this morning. I also went for tea this morning. Had too much coffee yesterday. Mookie's still speaking in emojis. I wonder if that will be sustained throughout the uh, <laughs> conference. <laughs> ah, so nice, nice. Okay, I'm already going to show uh, the next word because I think we'll see them coming in <laughs> with a slight delay. Uh, so what is the uh, first word that comes to mind when you think of 
the future of citizen science? Let us know in the chat as well. <laughs> I'm still seeing and I your, hope uh, foggy, your foggy morning was, words. Yeah. yeah, foggy, but I hope it's still for the morning. <laughs> <laughs> Annalise, I, I guess that means you're taking care of a baby. Um, yeah, I know there was a new arrival for Annalise. Uh, so I like to see together in community. Future is bright. Claire and Andrea both agree on this. Uh, lots of community. Exciting, amazing, promising. Mookie <laughs> still with the emojis. <laughs> Sunny, almost fireworks. That's really nice. Yeah, lots of optimism for the future. Yeah, Indeed. we'll be exploring this uh, in a lot more depth today. That's great because the first talk we have for this morning uh, is actually really going to focus on the future of citizen science. So we will find out soon which emojis uh, fit the best uh, to what's coming up uh, soon in terms of uh, uh, citizen science, but I would say citizen and societal engagement in general. Um, and um, we have with us our first speaker for the day, uh, who is uh, Lyndon Farrer, uh, Policy Officer at the DG uh, Research and Innovation of the European Commission. Welcome, Lyndon. Good morning. Um, so uh, you are going to tell us a bit about um, the uh, policy and program priorities for the European Commission within uh, the new Rise in Europe program, uh, and especially focusing on citizen and societal engagement. So thank you very much, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Yes, it's a real pleasure to be here today. I really enjoyed uh, yesterday's uh, presentations and all the things uh, that have been discussed, the amazing things that have been achieved by uh, EU citizen science in action. Um, <clears throat> this morning, I start uh, with explaining uh, why citizen and societal engagement is a policy and programme priority uh, for the European Commission. Uh, and then I move on to some of the ways um, that we will be uh, supporting it. So uh, if we move to the next slide. The first thing I'd say is that engagement uh, is promoted as part of an integral uh, component of EU open science policy. Uh, now, we've heard about open science. Um, it's much more than open access to publications and fair and open data. These are absolutely essential. They're integral parts of open science as well. They're very important for excellent science. But in fact, open science is much broader than this. It's, a, it's an approach based on open cooperative work and the systematic sharing of knowledge and tools as widely and as early as possible in the RNI process. And one of the practices associated with this is involving all relevant knowledge actors, such as citizens, civil society, and end users in the co-creation of RNI agendas and contents. Uh, so this is really the broad policy frame and, and uh, the, the main policy package under which uh, we really promote uh, citizen science. So if we move to the next slide, please. So specifically then, why do we promote citizen science and societal engagement? Uh, I'm not going to read out all of the reasons uh, that are listed here, but I'll mention a couple of them. But the first reason uh, I would give is that engagement can contribute to excellence. Now, this is really speaking the language of research, of science. Um, why do we think this? Because it enlarges the scope of RNI, the quality and the quantity of the data collected, discussed and analysed. Uh, and importantly, it leverages collective intelligence. Now, this is often excluded from contributing to research and innovation. I would say that that is the opposite of excellence to almost systematically, whether on purpose or not, to exclude uh, this collective intelligence. We really think we need to leverage this uh, in so many different fields. Secondly, it contributes to effectiveness. Uh, what do we mean by effectiveness? Uh, really, it's value for taxpayers money. Uh, but how does it do this? Well, by aligning the outcomes and the processes uh, with the needs, values and expectations of society. And it helps ensure greater relevance and uptake of 
the results of this RNI investments. Now, of course, it makes little sense from a public funding perspective uh, to to really push technology development down certain at, uh, down certain avenues uh, or to res to to end up with scientific results uh, that don't reflect uh, the values or take into consideration uh, societal aspects. And you know, this is really important for effectiveness. And there's a link there clearly, of course, to excellence as well. Moreover, it helps trigger behavioral changes, uh, behavioral changes uh, in consumers, in citizens, and in institutions. Uh, and in many areas of research and innovation, this is a crucial aspect of, of rising to the challenges that we're, that we're looking at. Finally, and something that's really come to the fore uh, in recent years, uh, not just for climate change, but of course, more recently for the pandemic, it's the importance of the trust of society in science. And we think that engagement can increase openness, transparency and co-ownership of society. Uh, it can lead to more inclusive outcomes uh, and it helps foster mutual learning between science and society. And this is really, uh, this is part of a policy that's been uh, around at the European Commission for several decades now, this importance of improving the interactions and the relationships between science and society. So if we move to the next slide, please. Now, all of this said, um, engagement and citizen science uh, is really at the core of the new European research area. It's a core component. Uh, and the council conclusions uh, that my colleague Patrick Prenier yesterday referred to um, uh, mentioned this explicitly and it called for the development and the implementation of the Plastic Pirate Citizen Science campaign in cooperation with uh, the Horizon Europe mission uh, on seas and oceans and waters and to organize at least every two years a Europe-wide citizen science campaign again in synergy with the Horizon Europe missions. Now this is you know this is one activity and you could say that this isn't addressing everything but I think this is an activity that can really uh, leverage some interest uh, and get national uh, ministries uh, and stakeholders uh, and citizens across the EU uh, really involved uh, in different aspects of the citizen science campaign it's a real opportunity I think uh, for citizen science and it can help strengthen it too now one of the things we've put in place kind of leading up to this uh, is what we call a mutual learning exercise uh, which is essentially for member states to learn from each other uh, about certain issues and in this case we're launching one on citizen science and the idea is to identify good practices uh, to support the scaling up of citizen science including potentially campaigns uh, for collaboration across the era but I suppose more importantly also is the idea that we develop uh, a common understanding of the different uh, aspects of engagement that are strong in different European countries because I think different European countries have different traditions uh, and different ways of engaging uh, that they can bring to the table and that we, that we can all learn from. Uh, in addition, in Horizon Europe, we've uh, launched two specific calls. There will be more in future work programs. Um, and these are really there to strengthen uh, citizen science. Uh, the first is called a capacity building and brokering network to make citizen science an integral part of the European research area. I think the title says it all. There's uh, four million euros uh, that have been put, uh, allocated to that, let's say. Uh, and then the second uh, topic is called supporting and giving recognition to citizen science in the European research area uh, and this will uh, launch an action um, once the evaluation is complete hopefully we have a, an action that will uh, support at least 100 um, uh, citizen science pilots or ideas or, or starting initiatives uh, to to get going uh, through open calls. It will help support 25 more established citizen science uh, initiatives or activities to work towards sustainability and it will launch an EU prize for citizen science. Now if you look at the budget of these two actions, that's 9 million uh, and see the overall budget that's available in this era part of the work program, uh, this is really a considerable investment. I think this, is, uh, this bodes well for the next uh, few years. So if we move to the next slide please. So some useful evidence uh, for engagement for the science society relationship and also specifically for citizen science, I would say, comes from uh, a recent Euro barometer, uh, Euro barometer 516. It's on European citizens knowledge and attitudes towards science and technology. Um, it's uh, really the very latest uh, in a long running series of Eurobarometers focused on science and society. And this particular exercise takes up several strands from different 
uh, parts of this Science Society Eurobarometer history uh, and brings them together into one quite uh, extensive questionnaire. And, and you know, people who were uh, responding to these questions with face-to-face -face, uh, interviews and also online interviews, depending on the coronavirus uh, measures in place, uh, it took about an hour of each respondent's time to go through these questions. This is a quite a significant investment. So the fieldwork took place between April and May 2021. Uh, the sample size overall was more than 37,000 respondents, um, but there were 26,000, uh, more than 26,000 from the EU 27. So we also uh, surveyed countries that are not in the EU, but are uh, surrounding countries or in the era. So there are 66 question units plus demographic questions, which allow uh, a fair amount of analysis uh, of the, you know, what kinds of backgrounds do we, uh, can we expect for people who uh, have certain attitudes towards science and uh, who are the people that are getting engaged. So um, the questions were broadly speaking on knowledge um, about science, the impacts uh, and governance of science and technology. Uh, views on scientists, what people think about scientists, uh, citizen engagement in science and technology. Uh, then there were some specific fo uh, focus areas on young people, gender equality and social responsibility. And then it finished uh, with uh, some questions on the comparative advantage of the EU. Uh, so if we move to the next slide, please. So I'm going to, not going to present very much from this uh, from this Eurobarometer because there's just so much there. But I'll go through two sets uh, of results uh, just because I think they're pertinent today. Uh, the first is around uh, the high level of interest in science that we found with this Eurobarometer, uh, and this is for new medical discoveries, it's for environmental problems, and it's new scientific discoveries and technological developments. And, you know, this high level of interest, which is represented by the blue bar, uh, has increased since the last time that we asked this question in 2010. So it's at 86% now for medical discoveries, uh, whereas in 2010, uh, it was four points lower. 89% um, of uh, respondents are interested in environmental problems. This is up one point from 2010. Uh, and in terms of new scientific discoveries and technological developments, this is up three points since 2010. So we can see an increase over the last uh, 10 years, which I think uh, is a good thing. Um, if we look at the orange bars, what we see there is that uh, this is the how well informed citizens feel that they are. And this is always for these three uh, response categories uh, lower. So although a lot of people are very interested in medical discoveries and environmental problems, fewer feel very well uh, informed, though the number that feel informed has increased uh, quite a lot since 2010. So I, th I think this this is a good backdrop. Uh, this is encouraging. Uh, it shows also that there's room for improvement. If we move to the next slide. Now, this is a more complex <laughs> set of results, but what it shows is an impressive, I would say, an impressive level of engagement uh, with science and technology. Uh, and also for some of the example activities uh, for engagement, an increasing level of engagement. So roughly speaking, from the top to the bottom, it, it goes from more passive forms of engagement to more active forms, but it's uh, that's a bit of a uh, qualitative judgment. But uh, let's say we start with uh, watching documentaries or reading science and technology related publications. 21% uh, of EU citizens say that they do this regularly and it's a bit smaller on my screen, but 38% say they do this occasionally. So this is quite a high level, but then we can go down, we see a few, you know, smaller proportion visit science and technology museums, but still quite high. Uh, but then we also have people who regularly or occasionally attend public meetings uh, about science and technology. They actively take part in scientific projects. Uh, they take part in clinical trials and things like this. Now, I think you know th there's really a wealth of data from this Eurobarometer and you can really delve down to the country level. Uh, you can look at the cross tabulations with other questions uh, or with the demographic uh, issues. And we also looked in terms of engagement at barriers to engagement. I think this is quite an interesting set of questions and also how people would like to be engaged, although this tends to mirror how people are actually engaged. Uh, but anyway, I think this is a useful set of data for, for practitioners, but also shows um, that a lot of EU citizens are actually already engaged. Uh, we could see there that 3% of EU citizens say that they're already regularly engaged in taking part in scientific projects, and a further 9% occasionally take part. 
so I think, you know, could we get better data on this perhaps, but the Eurobarometer is a pretty robust uh, means of surveys. So I think this is this is good standard evidence and, and something useful that we can all uh, work with. So if we um, move to the next slide, please. I'll move on to our program, the main program uh, that I'm responsible uh, within, uh, and that's Horizon Europe. I've been working on uh, this uh, and before that, the Science Within Four Society part of the program. And you can see here the structure, um, just to, to provide an outline. Uh, pillar one is on excellent science. Pillar two uh, is on global challenges and European industrial competitiveness. Pillar three, innovative Europe with the European Innovation Council. Pillar two is quite interesting uh, compared to Horizon 2020 because it brings the industrial parts of the program together with the societal challenges part as a way of reducing the siloing and, and to bring the research and innovation closer together. Underpinning this, uh, we can say that, is the widening participation and strengthening the European research area part of the programme. Uh, and this includes reforming and enhancing the European RNI system, uh, which brings uh, almost all of the bullet points for the science within for society part uh, forward. Uh, but it will focus on strategic supports like the ones that I mentioned earlier on citizen science uh, and in areas related, for instance, to gender equality, uh, or science education or research careers and things like this. And the bottom up uh, actions that used to be in the Science Within Four Society part are mainstreamed into the program as a whole. They should be being taken up within the clusters. Um, if we move to the next slide, please. One thing that's not on the uh, structure is the missions. Now, what are the missions? Uh, there are something new for Horizon Europe. It's a new way of doing research and innovation. It's a portfolio of actions intended to achieve a bold and inspirational as well as a measurable goal within a set time frame uh, with particular impact for science and technology. So we could expect to see, for instance, portfolios of projects uh, that include innovation actions. They include uh, frontier science. They include research uh, on uh, the regulatory environment, they include uh, citizen science, uh, user-led innovation activities, uh, public uh, engagement more generally, um, all sorts of actions working together to try and solve particular missions. Now, what are these missions? They've just recently been published. Uh, we have one on adaptation to climate change. At least 150 European regions and communities become climate resilient by 2030. There's one on cancer, improving the lives of more than 3 million people. There's one on oceans and waters by 2030, restoring them. One on uh, 100 climate neutral and smart cities by 2030. And one uh, which is around uh, living labs, 100 living labs and lighthouses to lead the transition towards healthy soils. Now, if you look at the background work that's been done on the missions, uh, which are in these two reports by Mariana Mazzucato, uh, you see really that engagement and citizen science as part of that uh, is a really important and fundamental aspect of the missions. Uh, and you'll hear it often said that without uh, effective engagement, these missions are not going to work. Um, so we really need uh, to ensure that there's a very high level of engagement in the missions. Um, and I think there are, you know, there's a lot of work being done to think about how this can work in a portfolio approach, because of course, uh, there are other kinds of actions that are required as well. So if we move on to the next slide, please. So some example uh, Horizon Europe project activities. Now, actually, these are modelled um, from the work of Mariana Mazzucato, uh, who provided with this kind of breakdown of different engagement areas. And this is something that's gone into our guidance for applicants and experts. It's the programme guide. There's a link there and there's, there's much more detail uh, to, to help applicants navigate this, in, uh, this, uh, this heightened attention to engagement. Um, I'll do this from memory because I've lost the slide. Uh, so we have co-design activities, uh, and this is really looking at developing roadmaps uh, and agendas, um, and often includes deep discussion on the implications, the ethics, the benefits, and the challenges of RNI courses of action and technology development. Uh, and those of you that have been involved, for instance, in the Science Within Four Society part of Horizon 2020 will be familiar with responsible research and innovation. I think this ethical uh, and reflective uh, approach uh, to co-design uh, lends a lot uh, comes a lot from uh, this focus on responsible research and innovation, which is still something that we focus on and is still a priority in Horizon Europe. Then we have co-creation activities and involving uh, citizens and end users directly in the development of new knowledge or 
innovation, for instance, through citizen science and user-led innovation. We know that citizen science can also uh, be encapsulated within co-design. We don't strictly define uh, citizen science. We prefer to leave it very open uh, because we know that there's lots of different traditions out there, different ways of approaching this in different uh, disciplines and thematic areas. Uh, but we would give citizen science as an example under co-creation uh, without being too stringent on this. And then we also have an area which is called co-assessment. Now, this is uh, perhaps less uh, developed, but I think something that will really come to the fore in the missions. And this is uh, a sort of continual or iterative feedback uh, by citizens and society to the governance of a project, a portfolio project, some policies or programs. And you can see here, there's some links here to co-design, but it's really following things through uh, by involvement in governance and steering like that. So this is how we would envisage engagement taking place. Uh, but it, it doesn't matter if it falls between either any of these categories or comes up with something else. I don't think we're too uh, strict in general. Uh, it's just there as a sort of guidance uh, that can help applicants understand. So if we move to the next slide, please. So this is a slide just to show the very high level uh, political support uh, we have uh, for promoting engagement and citizen science. You can see a quote there from our commissioner uh, who is very supportive of citizen science. Um, she featured in a video that we produced about citizen science on the bottom left of the screen. Um, and it also includes uh, the action project um, alongside two other projects. Uh, and then there's a screenshot on the bottom right from the uh, CSSDG German Presidency Conference, a really successful co conference that took place just over a year ago in Berlin and also online. Um, and this produced a declaration about how citizen science can support and work towards the Sustainable Development Goals, um, which is, uh, I think, an important document, uh, a good reference point. Uh, but equally interesting uh, are the, you know, the fact that there's just so many different ways that citizen science uh, can work towards and support the SDGs across all those all of those different SDG areas. And I think if you look at the documentation and the proceedings from that conference, you really get an idea of, of the plethora of different approaches out there. It was really eye opening. So if we move to the next slide, please. So this is actually the last slide now. So it's really a summary. Um, citizen and societal engagement uh, can improve the quality of the effectiveness and the trust of society in research and innovation. It's an integral part of the EU's open science policy. It's an agreed priority for the European research area. Uh, of course, this is reflected in our program Horizon Europe, where engagement is foreseen across the program and becomes an evaluated aspect of the excellence criterion. Um, it challenges to ensure that high quality practices support and work towards the sustainable development goals and other societal objectives uh, building on efforts in Horizon 2020. So with that, uh, I'm, I come to an end. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions uh, if there are any. Thank you very much, uh, Lina, and for, for this very detailed uh, presentation. Um, I have seen some nice reactions uh, in the chat, people sharing uh, links to some of the resources you mentioned, uh, as well as uh, colleagues finding uh, evidence of uh, um, some of the activities they, they are doing uh, in the data you have shown from, from the Eurobarometer, which is, is really interesting. Um, there is maybe one question that we can very quickly, we're a bit over time, but really quickly, maybe we can uh, address a question from yesterday that was really interesting about um, the way uh, that uh, this support towards societal engagement uh, will be monitored uh, in the coming years uh, to authorize Europe. Uh, it's really interesting, I think, for all of us to know better how you plan to see how uh, the, 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 the the uptake of uh, the methodologies uh, towards citizen engagement uh, will happen, uh, especially within research projects, especially now that there is no more uh, specific funding programs such as SWAFs. Uh, it would be really interesting to see how citizen science mainstreams uh, within uh, all the other uh, fields of research. Absolutely. That's a really good question. It's very important because we've put in place these different mechanisms. One I didn't really mention was this evaluation um, under the excellence criterion. Uh, engagement practices uh, become an evaluated aspect uh, for virtually all of the work programs in Horizon Europe. I think this really raises the bar. Um, so we need to keep an eye on this and we do need to have a look at the data when, we, when it comes in to see whether the mechanisms we put in place are working, uh, whether we need to take further actions. 
Um, so in terms of the work programs and topics, I think that's fairly easy to analyze. It's something that can be done. Uh, we've already looked at the contents of the work programs. We can see, for instance, a really increasing, accelerating interest in citizen science, especially if you look uh, from the beginning of Horizon 2020 up to the first work programs of Horizon Europe. So that's easy to do. Um, for the contents of what the, or the activities that the projects are undertaking in terms of engagement, this is also easy to do in that it's, going to be, it's part of the periodic reporting template uh, that project uh, coordinators, I suppose, will have to fill out. Uh, and it will include questions on the kinds of engagement activities. Roughly speaking, uh, are they doing uh, consultation workshops? Are they doing meetings with the general public? Are, are citizens involved in collecting data? Things like this. Uh, so this will come in, but it's not available until the first reporting period and probably the latter one too, because we know that things don't always start so uh, so quickly in projects. Um, this will feed the key impact pathway six, which is one of the nine impact pathways for the program. So it's really important that uh, we collect these data because they help uh, they help us understand uh, this. So I think we do need to probably launch some studies once we have uh, enough data in. It's not yet, um, but in the in the coming year or two, it, it comes to a point where we need to to look at things and check, and particularly as regards to proposals, uh, where we'd have to do some 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 analysis to see. Uh, how engagement's being taken up from the proposals through the evaluation process and then into the funded project. So uh, I don't know if that answered the question. Uh, it I did, I think it did. Yes, yes. And we look forward to, to in the future, uh, um, seeing this data and, and uh, we're really curious to see. I, I, we have the feeling uh, that there is a growing interest, of course, towards citizen science with such a strong focus being put on open science. Um, so fingers crossed that this will also translate into uh, numbers, in, into indicators that show this uh, growing uh, attention, a growing usage of citizen science in, in research uh, and innovation projects. I'm really sorry, we have to close uh, your your session now uh, as we are a few minutes late, but uh, I would like to, I think on behalf of all participants, thank you very much uh, for your presentation. It was all very clear and uh, maybe have a look at the chat and see if we miss any points or questions you can answer directly in the chat if you can stay with us a bit longer. I can, I will be staying. Thank you very much. That's it's been a great. pleasure. Thank you very much, Lyndon. Thank you. And now back to you, Michael, for the next session. Brilliant. A big thank you uh, to both of you. And yeah, you raised a very important point about uh, the numbers coming up, and it's exactly what we're going to be uh, looking at in our next session. Um, we're all aware of the impact of citizen science projects and initiatives, but in order to uh, make it clear the difference that we're making in the world, uh, we need to be able to assess our impact. Uh, we've talked about action and EU citizen science to large scale initiatives, which are uh, sadly coming to a close um, shortly, but whose impact will live on. And uh, both of which came up with uh, some interesting ways of assessing uh, impact. We're going to hear uh, from both of those projects um, in more detail how they did that. But first, I'd like to throw this question open to you participants uh, in the chat. Could you type in the chat, uh, briefly summarize, what would you say is the main challenge you face related to showing the added value of citizen science? Um, I'll give you a, a minute to type. So in the citizen science projects you're working on, what are the difficulties in showing added value in demonstrating your, your impact? Um, we'll be hearing a little bit from uh, our speakers in just a moment. I'm aware as well of this uh, 10 second delay on uh, on hoping that uh, means maybe you're still thinking and uh, and typing. So just to summarize your main challenge related to showing the added value of citizen science. Yeah, there is no one size fits all. It's a a really important point that the value that we create depends on who's defining that value. So yeah, uh, resistance from scientists. Okay, yeah, we're putting the public engagement slots and that's it. And Federica, yeah, you also draw on this multiple dimensions of, yeah, so many different types of impact and the challenge of, of measuring each. 
some more measurable than others. Yeah, as you say, Kat. So, yeah, Gaston, specifically in the health domain, that uh, medical professionals, as well as researchers more broadly, are reluctant to, to lean in. Uh, lack of time and resources from policymakers. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, you, these are all uh, really important challenges. Let's see if uh, some of these come up in our, in our presentations. Um, I'd like to invite, uh, first of all, uh, from Action uh, to hear more about their impact assessment methodology. I'd like to invite Antonella Passani, uh, who's head of research at T6 Ecosystems and who's been leading on impact assessment in the Action Project. Um, Hi. Over to you, Antonella. Hi. Good morning, everybody. Michael already present me, so I think I can just uh, go. And of course, I share all the challenges that you mentioned just now in uh, in the chat. I would like to share you uh, with you the methodology we developed together with our colleague at Drift um, for citizen science projects. And I also will present uh, some of our preliminary uh, preliminary results. As you know, our project is ending uh, soon in January, but so we are still uh, gathering some of our, uh, some of the data we need for the final, 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 super final input assessment. But let's see what we have so far. So I will share. My presentation. So our methodology is uh, First of all, uh, a very modular uh, methodology. You see, the areas of impact we consider are the environmental impact, the economic impact, the political impact, the social impact, the scientific impact, and the transformative potential. Each of these areas of impact has been uh, um, articulated, has been uh, um, divided, let's say, in different sub-dimensions that consider um, various aspects of those impact. It is important to stress that our methodology has been co-designed together with uh, the Citizen Science Project uh, supported uh, and part of the Consortium of Action. So has been uh, uh, tested uh, and enriched and changed during these, uh, uh, these two years of project. And of course, we'll keep change in, in, in the future. Um, it is based on our project, which are uh, working on a different kind of pollution, uh, but is flexible enough according to our uh, analysis so far to be adapted to other kind of the project that tackle other topics uh, it's been of course based on, uh, on literature review and the previous work done uh, by our colleagues uh, on the topics first of all Barbara and Teresa that will present uh, later on uh, the DITO project and, and many others so it's, it's an ongoing uh, an ongoing work uh, as I said, it is modular, so not all the areas of impact or dimensions are relevant for all the citizen science projects. Uh, and, and it's not expected that, that a single citizen science project impact all these areas and all these dimensions. So each of our projects, each of citizen science projects can pick up the areas of impact and dimension that are relevant and analyze only those ones. It's also flexible because we know very well by working with projects the difference between the ideal scenario, ideal world in which you analyze the situation before the beginning of the citizen science project, during the citizen science project, and then at the end, and do a nice comparison between uh, what was there before and what is uh, there at the, at the end. Uh, and also, uh, ideally, it would be ideal to uh, engage in the assessment not only the citizen science manager but also the volunteers the citizens and potentially other stakeholders in some cases this is possible so our um, data gathering tools are have been designed for covering all different stakeholders and all different uh, scenarios of uh, timing for the data gathering but we also did uh, let's say uh, easiest easier way so the, the to focus only on the exposed for example impact assessment only to citizen science manager so even if 
we use different approaches and we personalize the, the, the methodology and the data gathering process to each of the project, still you have a core set of indicators that can be uh, analyzed across all the project and gave us the possibility to, um, uh, to, to develop a scenario of the aggregated data value generated by the, uh, the action uh, um, pilots. Is fully operationalized. It means that if you want to analyze one of the dimension, uh, you can go on uh, on Zenodo, and you will be able to do more in the future through the action uh, toolkit um, and download the questionnaires we developed, test it out, adapt. Uh, we also have the same questionnaires in different languages in some cases, so this will be all available for the for the community. And the beginning of the process has been uh, um, based on what we call the Action Impact Assessment Canvas, which is a four-page uh, template that helps teams starting thinking about impact assessment and planning the, um, the process. Um, this has been proved to be a good uh, instrument, not only for assessing the impact of the project, but also to self-reflect within the teams and uh, better design also the, some of the interventions in order to, I mean, with the vision of achieving and maximizing potential impact. So as I said, uh, we, you see already some of these slides yesterday by Elena, the project coordinator of action, because they showed the aggregated uh, um, uh, data uh, from our, about our project. We did uh, support engage 16 pilots uh, and they engage more than 80, 40 uh, volunteers working on different kind of pollution. And the true um, awareness and raising and dissemination activity, they reach more than uh, 78,000 uh, people. They also uh, developed uh, uh, different uh, um, they, they also develop different scientific output uh, in the form of pictures, samples, audio files, data set, video, uh, also five composter because we did have a pilot working on um, composting bioplastic and testing if they really compost in the compost and the answer is no, by the way. Uh, and we also try to map uh, um, the potential impact or the actual impact of the project against the SDGs. In this sense, we evaluate um, the capability of our pilot to provide data for the monitoring of uh, uh, the SDGs, but also to act at the local or international level on some of the expected the targets. And you see here the, uh, the distribution. Then uh, we really uh, supported and pushed, let's say, uh, our pilot to engage citizens not only in uh, data collection, you see uh, 14 of them uh, do, but also to engage them in other stages. And you see here back the, um, the participatory life cycle uh, and which the toolkit is, uh, is based. So let's see now if Anneli is... Uh, is uh, in the backstage. I will leave the um, the mic to her for the scientific impact. Uh, I cannot see the backstage where I'm presenting. So, um, okay, no, she's having a problem. She says she's, she's not able to connect. Yeah, she's not that enough. Okay, so I will I will just uh, sorry, Anelia. I will try to present the your work as good as I can. So about the scientific impact, um, uh, we consider not only classic output so in terms of uh, papers uh, and uh, data sets but also the capability of project to uh, reach to develop to um, let's say make available uh, new knowledge resources and knowledge developed uh, and owned by the local communities and you see that most of the project are uh, our project are able to to do these uh, the level of interdisciplinarity and the attention to this interdisciplinarity was also considered by five of our projects and three focus on innovation and education, especially working on, on citizen science projects in the school environment. 
an example of capability of uh, unlock local uh, knowledge is the, the one uh, fostered by Wakapaniene that involved the citizens in environmental monitoring in a urban uh, um, uh, area, green area, um, and map uh, the quality and the, um, uh, the preservation of these uh, areas so while at the same time uh, empower the, lo the local community to think about this area as a resource uh, for them. Again, on, uh, on the scientific uh, impact, we work it on uh, the quality of data uh, and uh, the, cap the, the work on uh, openness and fairness of their data. And uh, the pilot show uh, a, 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 a good increment and a good attention to those, uh, uh, those topics, um, also thanks to the work done in, uh, uh, in the Action uh, Accelerator. And we know that this uh, capability of sharing data in an open and fair way is uh, a challenge for, uh, for many of, uh, of the project. And Restart is a good example on how to engage citizens in um, map and evaluate uh, data. Um, I think I'm, I'm a little bit uh, late, so I will uh, I will uh, go a bit quick on this. But most yeah. of our project work on social impact, uh, and we, our attention is to community building and empowerment as a first step of social impact, but going up to behavioral change. Uh, so many projects were uh, uh, focused and were able to achieve a good impact on uh, knowledge, skill and competence. That means that volunteers improve the level of understanding of the topic treated, their awareness on this topic, uh, their practical capability of gather and analyze data and also understand the scientific process. Uh, a good impact was also in the change of way of thinking, attitude and values, uh, but more could be done or should be done on behavioral change. So this is done by two main reasons that I would like to share with you because I think it's, it's inter interesting. On one hand, being as assessing information doesn't mean that you then move to action and change what you behave. But most important is that many, uh, most of the projects that participate in citizen science projects are already pro-science, pro-environment, pro-collaboration. So they are not the ones that they need to do the main behavioral change in terms, for example, of sustainability. Um, and here you see uh, the results from the volunteer surveys, considering only, only five pilots so far, uh, but uh, the majority of the participants increased their understanding of science and how science work. Economic impact is not a well-recognized impact of citizen science project, but still we think it's really important. Uh, considering only um, the cost saving in six projects, considering the number of hours spent by volunteers in doing data gathering and data analysis, and considering what, the, what if scenario, if a postdoc researcher was involved in doing the same work, the amount of money saved is 100,000 euro approximately. Of course, this is an estimate. We have to cut down this by the number of hours and time spent to engage and motivate volunteers. So this is not the net value, but still the figures are, 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 are important and are relevant. And also, uh, we, push, we invite all the citizen science projects to think about the potential economic impact of the local, on the local community by, for example, improving the reservation, the preservation of nature in some areas. See, this, uh, this was all, and we end with the political impact that give us the uh, bridge to the uh, event, uh, the satellite event of this afternoon, because many of our projects, many of citizen science projects around Europe are doing good in supporting citizens in being more um, uh, closer to policy process and to influence, for example, agenda setting on uh, some of the topic they, they work. And we hear about this yesterday by our pilot noise map on noise pollution in Barcelona. And uh, environmental impact is very difficult to, to consider. One more minute, Antonella. Ah, okay, so I'm, I was not so late. Uh, environmental impact is very difficult to uh, evaluate in the uh, time frame 
of uh, um, short citizen science project as the ones we studied because they they lasted the six months. Uh, but many, most of them are able to have an indirect impact uh, on environment by uh, working on awareness nasing, uh, supporting behavioral change, supporting policy changing, and strengthening community participation. And a good example of this is our Why Nature project with Why Nature. Um, is a not-for-profit that um, uh, build <laughs> practically create uh, urban forest uh, around uh, Italy, and thanks to the citizen science project, they were able to prove how uh, an urban forest uh, is a value uh, in terms of CO2 uh, reduction, and this uh, will be an important takeout uh, for policymaker and to motivate further investment, for example, in urban uh, forest. We end sorry, the... Antonella, to, uh, it's too late. Okay, yeah. I'm sorry. Transformative really potential. Over... Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just how a project is able to change the way of doing things. And uh, uh, we uh, we uh, were able to see how some of the projects are really can be really, really radical or iconic or in time on some of, our, of the topic we have for the sustainability Europe scenario that we all are, are engaged in right now. I'm really sorry for being a little bit long. The presentation no will be available and maybe with the questions we can go a little bit further on this. Great, and we'll save them for uh, after our next presentation. Thanks so much, Antonella, for touching on a lot of the challenges that were raised earlier on. It's going to be an interesting discussion. Uh, but next, I'd like to uh, bring in Barbara Kieslinger and Teresa Schaefer from the Center for Social Innovation in Vienna, in Austria, uh, to hear about the uh, methodology and the results of the impact assessment uh, from the EU Citizen Science Project. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Michael. And I think Teresa is going to share our slides uh, in a minute. Here we are already. Yes, thanks again. So uh, we have been leading uh, the uh, evaluation and impact assessment tasks for the EU citizen science um, platform. And um, if we already go to the next slide, a little bit of the background where we started from. So on the one hand, um, probably some of you are already familiar with this uh, evaluation framework that we have developed already some years ago for citizen science, where we have different dimensions of evaluating citizen science. And you will find more about it. It's published in this nice little book here, The Science of Citizen Science. And also, I think uh, Lyndon raised the bar uh, and with his presentation now, as he said that uh, co-assessment or co-evaluation will be an important part also of the future because we are just experimenting with co-evaluation in, in another project in COEC and it's quite challenging, challenging I can say. <laughs> um, anyways, yes, but this is where we started from, but for EU citizen science, which has been um, a kind of a, a, a coordination project, we were focusing more and starting really from the, log, from the logical framework model that uh, you are probably also most familiar with. So in terms of the methodology, we have already set uh, started with an initial set of KPIs that were already defined for a typical um, coordination project, like you know uh, how many visitors we want to have on the platform, how much training we want to provide, how many resources, etc., and our overall objectives, for example, to raise more awareness for citizen science across different target groups. So we started with all of the project uh, with the, all of the work package uh, leaders. To, the, to discuss a log frame template, which also included, for example, talking about uh, risks or, or project assumptions. So it was a little bit an extended version of this. And to collect uh, the data for, for this, you know, for the KPI framework, we used a mixed approach in terms of uh, qualitative and quantitative data gathering instruments. So I would just like to stress, at least from our understanding, qualitative uh, and quantitative data is important. It's important to tell the stories and it's important to get the numbers not, and not only focus on, on, on one or the other. And which are also important, and especially in times of, of, of COVID, uh, that you also have an adaptive and reflexive process, and you can also change according to the situation. 
Okay, so if we go to the next slide, so what kind of instruments did we use? And that's again something to stress, it's not rocket science. So basically we fall back to the typical instruments. It's just that it needs time. It has to be, has to be evaluation and impact assessment has to be planned from the very beginning and has to have the right resources for it because it is time consuming. And even more so if we speak then about co-evaluation. So what kind of instruments did we use? We used the typical surveys, questionnaire, feedback cards, you know, to get feedback from the target groups. Um, we worked a lot with interviews, especially with our project partners, and there we're planning to have some really nice, uh, really nice publication also coming forward with showing really how in these three years of EU citizen science, so much has changed uh, in terms of citizen science, and we have covered, captured that nicely by every year talking with our uh, project partners and reflecting on their organizational change and also on the wider contextual change that they have noticed in their in their regions or in their countries. Um, we did a lot of reflective exercises um, for the platform itself. You know, we, we did some user acceptance testing and with, you know, creating personas and, and having people walk through it and think aloud and protocoling that. And we do have, of course, the statistics from our online interactions on the platform. And Teresa is actually going to already give you some insight into what data we have collected, what results have we come up with from all these different exercises. Yeah, thank you, Barbara. Um, well, I will directly jump into, into the first results. And as you just mentioned, we, we said we would need both quantitative and qualitative um, evaluation and here this um, slide is shows just some of our key performance indicators that we tried to collect throughout the whole project and um, helps us to to understand um, how how far we reached out so for instance I think you heard it already yesterday that we have more than 50,000 users on our platform interesting is for instance also the returning the number of returning users that is more than 9700 which is really nice but also looking at how many uh, users registered to our platform to to um, at their projects and, and, and um, organizations uh, we see that um, our users spend more than three minutes uh, 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 on our <clears throat> on our platform normally and they come from 187 countries which is um, you think amazing most um, most users come from Spain but then we have US Italy Germany UK Netherlands France Belgium Portugal Austria just to name the first 10. We also created a high number of training modules that are already partly online and will come online within the next weeks and uh, training resources we have 390 users registered on our Moodle platform which is for the training modules um, and we have already 124 students enrolled to our, one of our first courses, which is the introduction to citizen science, which is really nice. And we have training modules in six different languages, which was also a challenge, of course. Um, we have more than 150 resources in 11 different languages and more than 190 projects. So you see the platform was also perceived as a way to to um, present projects there to the wider community and have really nice numbers of views on the resources and the project sites. You can see, for instance, the amongst the first most often visited project, we find food waste or um, uh, the ladybird experiment or cow slips observation. So from very different parts of Europe, you can see that um, projects have been accessed on the European platform. And with regard to the resources, of course, you have many resources there, but for instance, also the extra principles and characteristics have been accessed most often on our platform as they give the framework for citizen science in Europe. And then we have really nice dissemination numbers also that you, I think, have heard about yesterday, like 4,500 followers on Twitter. So this is, gives you an example of, 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 of um, quantitative data, but as we said, qualitative results are e equally important. Barbara mentioned that we had these interviews with our partner organizations. They come from 14 different countries. And it was really interesting to observe uh, where did we start from also in these countries and where are we now? And we could really see that these 
awareness and, and uptake and also support of citizen science in these different national contexts um, was increasing in all different countries in the last three years, although they started at a different level. So we really had some countries like uh, Lithuania or Hungary where the citizen science was hardly known and uh, partners within these within this three years did a, a remarkable job to, to get first citizen science associations established in their countries and reach out to other organizations. So we could observe uh, really interesting developments here on a European scale. Um, we realized in, that this, in this national context, uh, context, the national citizen science platforms are really important. They play an important role to, to get also um, the local citizens um, to do citizen science and that they are an important part, um, meeting point for the local citizen science practitioners. Um, and we saw some national platforms um, being established throughout the last three years, also often in close contact with citizen science. And they are really also a good place um, to adapt and translate and spread the resources that we have created on this European platform and shared on this European platform in the local contexts. And, and uh, not only the resources, also the training modules. So, so this is uh, really um, very good news. And we also see great potential um, um, in something that we have not seen so far or so often in this cross-country activity. So when, when uh, citizen science projects uh, take place in several different countries or different projects collaborate on the same research topic. And going then more to who are the main, let's say, beneficiaries of, of um, our project. Uh, um, so long, it has been mainly researchers and citizen science practitioners who who has who have been the main project beneficiaries. We they profited from the exchange of projects, resources, organizations, trainings, um, also from the the organization of the regular events, also these uh, SWAFs cluster meetings that were established on a monthly um, um, basis. And um, also supporting these networking activities and experience exchange across different projects and initiatives. Um, the involved organizations um, benefited from, from, from this project um, by certainly a support of networking and linking people, um, increasing the visibility for organizations who work already in the citizen science field. We have just heard that we have really a high number of European organizations who present themselves on the European citizen science platform and show that they are involved in that area. But we also see this increased knowledge by this experience exchange and all the resources and the things that we share on the platform. But we also see that other target groups um, still need to be further addressed, further addressed and more involved, like the policymakers. I mean, we had this very successful policy event. Um, this is something where we need to still further go into this direction. And there's, of course, also always this great potential to work, for instance, with younger audiences like schools or in, in informal educational activities. So what we see from, and this was only a first very um, quick introduction into, into our first outcomes, more will come at the end of this year. But what we see is that there's, there's this platform, there's this community created, and um, yeah, now it's, it's in the hands of all of us to, to take it in our hands and, and continue the work here that was started within this project. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, uh, Teresa and Barbara. Really interesting to hear not only the impact assessment um, that you developed within EU Citizen Science, but also a bit about the impact that the platform itself uh, has been having. I'd uh, love to invite Antonella back as well from Action, as well as uh, Anneli uh, Janssens, who was also um, so, uh, researcher at Drift in Rotterdam, also involved in the uh, Action project. Uh, to hear a bit more about your thoughts. We had um, some comments in the initial challenges. I wanted to come back to this one uh, about the fact that, so Claire Murray was saying that smaller local impact is often downweighted, but can have uh, a big impact. I wanted to hear a bit your thoughts about balancing this, uh, the large scale impacts and the smaller local level impacts, which you touched on a bit. 
with maybe I can like take this. Yeah, yeah, yeah maybe I can sure. take this. I think that um, we have. I mean, I, I just got an interview with uh, with some some project uh, guys, and they say we have to understand if we really want a measure that fits for all and we can go there or if we want to multiply many 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 small revolutions and many 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 small radical changes and i think that this way of let's say franchising uh, citizen science and uh, and changing bits uh, a different uh, in different way at local level and then have a measurement of the aggregated value of all these mi micro uh, changes is uh, is something fascinating and is something that I think is aligned with the European way of doing things that is global and local at the same time. So adapted to the local community, local culture, but still with a common vision, common values. Yeah. So finding that balance between the uh, between the global and the local. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Anneli, I also want to bring you into the conversation as well. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I, I think it's a really interesting question. And I think we've also tried to capture some of that uh, tension in the transformative potential in saying that a project by itself isn't necessarily going to change the world. However, if you see it in a broader ecosystem and if you see, well, together with lots of other projects um, and other institutions, uh, you can transform uh, society and, and change uh, status quo. Um, so in that sense, um, yeah, these small, small impacts, so to say, or at least local impacts are, uh, are crucial. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And it, and it links to this comment I also see in the challenges from uh, Jan Laros. He says these impacts are often long-term behavioral changes with multi-causal roots. There's not this easy one-to-one -one cause and effect. Uh, Barbara, I, w I wonder if you have some... Uh, some thoughts on this as well. Yeah, I mean, also a little bit coming back to the question that Muki was raising now here in the chat. So this balance between qualitative and quantitative, I think I already addressed it a little bit in my presentation. I mean, uh, just to uh, give you the background, I'm much more working on, on a, a qualitative uh, scale, but we do have in our institutions colleagues and, and even Teresa is also working uh, more quantitative than, than me. But, <laughs> but uh, I would say I, at least we have already seen a bit more uh, a balance here in the last years personally. I think we have realized that telling the stories that happen at very small scale are also impacting people. It's not only the numbers. I mean, I'm not so sure about uh, uh, at political level. I guess there it's still often the numbers that count, but <laughs> I would say uh, also telling good stories. That was my experience. It was very, very important and can be so impactful. And I think we shouldn't make a, a fall in the trap of saying even in citizen science projects. Sometimes we think that all of us, we have, it's only good citizen science project if you engage many people. And I would say, no, it really depends on the kind of project that you're doing. And you can do a fantastic uh, locally embedded citizen science project with a small community, uh, but that would be very, you know, they, they would benefit a lot from that. So um, I think it's, it's, it's on us also to tell these stories and to get this balance between the uh, quantitative and qualitative side of it. I think both are, are, are important. Absolutely. And what about you, Teresa? What would your advice be to uh, project designers and coordinators on this? No, I agree. As Barbara said, I think it very much much depends on the project. I mean, there are projects um, that have a focus of involving more people and they can then really have a focus on this quantitative analysis and showing impact in uh, not so much in the depth, but more in the breadth with um, questionnaires to large numbers of people. But then we have projects where we only have a small number of people involved, but we really want to understand what's happening more in the depth, you know, into getting all the details out of that. And I think this is something that maybe project managers, you ask me what a project manager should do, could already think about. What is the context I'm, I'm really dealing with and, and how would I rather focus to, to try to get the impact on large scale for many participants, but not maybe not so in detail? Or, or would I rather, you know, focus more on this understanding also the why and how behind that? But this is a very complex question. It's very difficult to give an answer that fits everything. In Absolutely. One yeah. <laughs> 
feel as though finding that, ba that delicate balance between the long and short term uh, assessments, the global and the local, the qualitative and the quantitative, uh, you've summed it up very nicely. Yeah, I like your, this point that it's, it's not only about the numbers, we have to be telling the stories. Uh, a big thank you uh, to all four of you for, uh, for sharing with us and a big thank you to all the participants in the chat as well. It's been another lively conversation. I think, uh, yeah, this, uh, we're, the future at least uh, will be very carefully assessed in terms of fits and scientific thanks. It's thank time thank for you. us to move on. Uh, it's time for a coffee break. And you're all invited to join us in the social room uh, for a coffee break. You can find that on the left of the screen uh, in sessions. We'll open the, the, the social room now and look forward to having a coffee with you until we come back at half past. Uh, and this will be for our tour of Europe. So we'll be back here on stage uh, in 15 minutes um, for a, a, a speed tour of uh, Europe. Looking forward to it. Uh, so see you in the, in the coffee break. Hello and welcome back uh, to the main stage. We hope you had a nice coffee or tea and uh, you enjoyed also the time in the social room where you could uh, chat with uh, some project partners. Um, so we are back here for a really, really interesting uh, session now uh, titled Tour of Europe Reflections on Citizen Science Nationally. And you will see we have uh, several European countries represented here uh, thanks to the involvement of the EU Citizen Science Project. Uh, I would like to welcome on the stage with me uh, Carole Paleco, uh, who is going to uh, host uh, this uh, session with me today. Uh, Carole is International Relations and Projects Liaison Officer at the Royal Belgian Institute of Natural, Natural Sciences here in Brussels. Uh, welcome, Carole, and thank you for introducing this session for us today. Thank you very much, Marcia. I'm really glad to uh, introduce this session with you. Um, well, it's a, a session which uh, we wanted to, 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 to provide you with a, a sense of um, uh, a flavor of what some of the partners have experienced uh, with the EU City and Science Project. Um, so it's a tour of Europe. Uh, as you will see, you will have feedback from uh, Austria, from Florian Hegel, from the University of Natural Sciences and Applied Sciences, from uh, Marie Cour, who is at the Royal Belgian Institute of Natural Sciences in Belgium, from Velio, and from the University and the Natural History Museum in Estonia, in Tartu, then the Natural History Museum in Paris, um, France, uh, it will be uh, her, Alexandra will share her experiences uh, with you, and then we'll go to Greece with Kostas Karantas uh, from the Thessaloniki, and Alexandra Kzelevli from Hungary, um, we, from the Environmental Social Science Research Group, and also from Italy with Andrea Sforzi from the Maria Natural History Museum. So they will share with you all um, the impact that uh, this project has had into their uh, practices at institutional but also at national level. So I give you back the floor, Marcia, and enjoy this nice panel session. Thank you very much, Carol, and welcome. It's really, really nice to see you all here on the stage with me today. Um, as this session, as we have a really short time for this session, uh, I'm going straight into the first question. So as Carol mentioned, we are really going to focus on the legacy uh, of this project, but also what it has meant for you to be involved in, in new citizen science. Uh, so we are going to both look at the past and at the future and share some experiences together. Um, we, um, I have a few questions that I would like to ask you, but I would really like to invite also uh, all the participants uh, to uh, do not hesitate to ask questions in the chat if there are, uh, if there is anything they would like to hear from you. Uh, I think we are maybe missing someone, but I hope that my colleagues in the best stage will make miracles happen and have everyone back here. In the meantime, let's go straight into the first question. And uh, I would really like to hear from you what do you think are uh, positive takeaways 
uh, that you have from being involved in this uh, EU citizen science uh, project. Uh, maybe something new you learned, some networking opportunities, uh, new collaborations, anything uh, that you think could be inspiring uh, also for other participants to hear. And as I mentioned yesterday, yes, we really don't have a system uh, in this uh, platform that can make uh, me understand who wants to speak first. I will decide uh, the order for uh, all of you. Uh, so I will uh, invite first, uh, I will go by preference, personal preferences of countries. No, I'm joking. Uh, let's do it like, like this. So since I'm originally from Italy, uh, I'll give the floor to uh, Italy first. Uh, so, Andrea, welcome to, to, to the stage. Thank you very much, Marcia. So, uh, a very quick answer to, to the first question. It's a long list, but I pointed out just five main points. So, our participation had multiple benefits. Uh, first of all, they gave us the opportunity to participate in the definition of the main documents uh, within EU citizen science. It was very important to uh, proceed with citizen science. And then we were engaged in the process of creating and shaping the, the platform that was so co-created and very well done from our point of view. And we are also uh, willing to, to continue in the, in the future. And the, the project offers us the opportunity to increase the networking in, in Italy and in the EU but mainly in Italy, but because we are now uh, building up a, a, a strong community. And uh, this was also thanks to the EU Citizen Science Project. So uh, the, the tools and resources that were produced uh, will be used from, from us and from many partners in Italy and gave us the opportunity to positive discussion with other uh, Italian and European colleagues. Thank you, Andrea. That's really nice uh, to hear. And fingers crossed that uh, the citizen science community in Italy keeps uh, growing. Um, okay, then, since I live in Brussels, maybe the next person could be Marie. Welcome, Marie, to the stage. Thank you, Marcia. Um, I think for us here um, at Arbins in Brussels, the main benefit was networking. Being informed about the national networks in other European countries is a big plus. Especially in Belgium, the situation is very different from one region to another. And learning and looking at the way other countries coordinate initiatives is, uh, is, has been very inspiring. Apart from the networking, another um, more in-house plus benefit was that um, by being dedicated to the project, it helped to activate changes within our organization. Like um, we were encouraged to organize more uh, citizen science work group meetings, etc. And then something else, the, the platform, with, especially with the Moodle trainings, um, we used that to um, in, inform our colleagues more about citizen science and motivate them to, to use this too um, in their science. I think that's the main things for our part. Thank you, Marie. Um, let's see, going through geographical proximity, maybe I think the closest city to us is probably Paris, I would say. So welcome, Alexandra. Thank you, Martina. Um, well, I would like to share with you two specific examples of the benefits of uh, getting involved in that uh, project. And uh, the first one, I think um, the main benefits for us is the visibility given to the project carried out by the museum at the European level, because uh, we are in charge of the coordination of uh, two networks of factors engaged in citizen science. And uh, each of that network has its own platform uh, with a quite similar objective of sharing experiences, sharing projects and resources. And uh, the articulation uh, between the platforms managed by the museum and the European platforms uh, allows to increase uh, the diffusion, the visibility, the acknowledgement of the project. And that is um, the first point I wanted to, um, to notice. And um, the second one, I think um, another benefit, um, it's uh, the outcomes of the event Citizen Science for Policy Across Europe, uh, organized in June with the ministers from uh, several countries. 
uh, because the dissemination of the invitation to this event to uh, the Ministry of Culture, which supports one of the network I'm talking about. Uh, that invitation has raised uh, awareness on the subject and uh, led to the writing of an article on the European dynamics of citizen science in the Ministerial Review, Culture and Research. So uh, I think that uh, these are two concrete examples of the positive uh, takeaway from our participation to the EU citizen science project. That's great. I think we, we are collecting some really nice, inspiring stories. Thank you very much, Alexandra. Um, let's see, uh, maybe the next country could be a country where I would really like to be right now, hoping that it's warmer than here in Brussels. So maybe we can jump to Greece. Welcome, Costas. Uh, hello, everyone. So it's a pleasure to be here. I'm trying to, to provide with some short uh, answers to a question that can be discussed for hours. Uh, for us, there, there have been some obvious uh, uh, positive takeaway messages, let's say, and results concerning our participation. So, uh, first of all, uh, our deeper understanding and experience and knowledge gained in citizen science. Networking, as already mentioned, was a very important aspect and I think that it's missing, it's still missing from the community and it's very highly appreciated and it will be highly appreciated in the future. Also, uh, we had the chance to investigate in a much more thorough way what's happening in the country because we don't have an organized community and uh, we hope that at some point there will be a critical mass that would, be, that would allow the creation of such a community. And uh, this critical mass will be supported also by an outcome indirectly influenced by our participation in the project, which is uh, the fact that we now are engaged in a new project where our university, we are a university, so we see everything from our own, let's say, perspective, will uh, develop a citizen science hub, one of the first four citizen science hubs for universities in Europe. And this would allow us also to attract much more activities and organize much more activities and also uh, reflect upon the structure of a university that currently has 75,000 students. So it's a huge organization. So just some of the stories that I can endlessly, endlessly discuss. Thank you, Costas. And uh, I'm sure participants can get in touch with all of you to know more stories, but this you're sharing with us are, are really inspiring. Uh, let's imagine we were driving up from Greece all the way up to Europe. And I think the next country we would meet is uh, Hungary. And we have Alexandra joining us from ESSRG today. Welcome, Alex. Thank you, Martia. Um... I'm really happy to share some of uh, the result uh, due to the project we could reach uh, in the past few years. Uh, I think um, one of the main uh, um, uh, achievements that ESSRG managed to do in the past few years was to develop a network of citizen science practitioners and researchers almost from scratch, which means that we had 10 almost um, 10, 12 um, citizen science projects in Hungary that we know of. And by today, uh, we see an augmentation in the number of these projects, and we can talk about 30, 40 projects all in all in the country. So it's a great news for us that it's growing constantly. Um, and we could uh, get in touch with this project and build a solid uh, network in a way. Um, and this is mostly due to the sociological interviews that I've started to do with my colleague from uh, 2021, uh, from February uh, till November. We've just finished this process. Um, and in this interviewing, we managed to get out more information uh, about these local citizen science projects and mostly about their needs. What we see by now, it's uh, going to be very important to have this uh, research done because these local um, citizen science practitioners doesn't really know about each other and about their methodologies and the financial background of the project. So this is going to fill the gap, this information gap we, we noticed in this uh, informal network that we try to formalize over these uh, years. And also, I think one of the great achievements due to this project 
that we managed to reach out to policymakers uh, in Hungary. That wasn't easy before, uh, mostly because not too many policymakers uh, took uh, the citizen science issue seriously, I think. And now we see changes over time and they are happy to to discuss these topics further with us and have certain collaboration um, at the local national level. Um, so that's what I would share, I think, in this. In this Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Alex. I think we, we, we can hear a really nice mix of uh, both institutional changes, so change, things changing internally within all your institutions and also more ecosystem changes, so changes at a broader level. So it's really interesting to hear. So let's keep driving all the way up. And I think Austria will be the, the next country we would uh, drive through. So welcome, uh, Florian. Yeah, thank you very much. And thank you all for sharing your really interesting uh, stories about your takeaways in your countries. Um, as you may know, in Austria, we have already a very established uh, network for citizen science. Uh, but it was a really great experience to be involved in this co-creation process of such a big platform in all these different languages. It was really great to be part of that. Thank you very much for that. Um, in Austria, we benefited a lot uh, of the collection of the citizen science specific trainings um, and materials and guidelines, and especially of the MOOCs you developed over the last two years. We have a lot of workshops uh, for fostering citizen science in Austria. And in all these workshops, we implemented now also links to the MOOCs and the guidelines and the participants participants in the workshops benefit a lot um, from these materials developed in the project. That's great. That's really nice to hear, Florian, that it was uh, inspiring even for a country like Austria, where there is already a lot of uh, attention to citizen science. And now for the last country, let's take a train. I think we have been driving and polluting enough from Greece all the way up to uh, Austria. So let's reach Tartu. Uh, by train and welcome Velio to the conversation. Hi Velio. Hello everybody. Yeah, I will quickly give, give a background for our university or our institution. So University of Tartu is Estonia's oldest university uh, and we are a distinct institution, a natural history museum and botanical garden in, in our university. And we have already quite a long history with citizen science. Our first project uh, where we needed to use the term citizen science was uh, 2012 in uh, EU 7 program, uh, Project EUBON. And we dealt with um, uh, biodiversity observation networks and citizen science input into this. And we tried to find ways to improve data management and, and so on. But one of the first tasks for me was to find a fitting translation to the term citizen science in Estonia. And it was quite a challenge. And actually, it is still now. There are different translations. So it actually shows where, where we are. So we are still a bit um, finding our way and, and struggling a bit. But we have uh, some quite big uh, regular events like National Bio Blitz occurring. So we see that Estonia is on eastern border of the uh, European Union and actually it uh, defines a lot what our, our options and uh, logistics already have been uh, quite a challenge uh, and our country is probably not the first choice uh, destination for workshops or conferences and, and we are uh, last in the line and uh, here comes the project, uh, what I see the uh, great benefit because of the uh, pandemics. Uh, we had to use a lot of uh, project virtual meetings. Uh, so in a sense, it gave us a lot of more options to see and hear our European uh, colleagues, our partners a lot more. And uh, in general, it's really important to maintain this international cooperation, uh, contact points and exchange information and EU Citizen Science Project uh, did that uh, successfully so thank you thank you Velio. it's it's uh, really nice to hear um i think um yeah it's really interesting to hear all these stories especially from countries with very different um 
uh, experience uh, in citizen science. And this leads me to my next question to all of you. Uh, we have, you have already um, hinted at some uh, changes that are happening within your countries. It's really nice to hear that some, in some cases there are new groups or networks or collaborations forming. Um, and we really hope this will increase in the future. Uh, so we have looked at the positive takeaways from the project, but let's also look into uh, the medium, uh, short, medium and, and long term impacts of having been part of you citizen science, uh, both for you, especially for you and, and for your institution. Uh, but maybe if you know also eventually, uh, as some of you already mentioned, also within uh, your country, what is what is coming up? Just uh, in a in a few words. Uh, this time, I will be very objective with the order of the presenters, and I will just uh, follow as the order as you as I see you uh, on the screen with me. So right next to me, I see Florian. So let's go back to Austria straight away. Thank you. Um, yeah, for me, I think the the short term impact of uh, EU citizen science is for sure the increased awareness for citizen science on a European level, um, especially through the combined outreach campaigns in the several countries. Um, it wouldn't be possible for one single country, especially such a small one as Austria, to be as present on a European level uh, without uh, such a European-wide platform. And this leads me uh, also to the long-term impact I see. Uh, for us, it's really important to have a, a reference point for citizen science on a European level, um, for example, for uh, future project proposals. And I'm very happy uh, that uh, EXA is now supporting uh, EU citizen science for the next five years. This is a very important step and thank you very much, EXA. Uh, for investing in EU citizen science. That's great. Thank you, Florian. And uh, we really uh, think that the community will stay alive and keep growing in the coming years. Um, so right next to Florian, I see Marie. Uh, welcome back. Hi. Um, yeah, it was uh, really nice to hear what Florian was telling about the immediate impact that like all together we can make a bigger impact than all the tiny countries uh, on their own. That's that's something I agree with completely. And then apart from that, uh, for our institutes, um, we learned a lot through the Moodle trainings from the platform. That's something I want to highlight uh, on the short term impacts. Uh, also, we created a video uh, in which an entomologist and citizen science explain um, taxonomy for starters. And that's a video we benefit from with the institute that was really made in within the framework of the project. And the plan would be to use this video to create a Moodle training on uh, taxonomy for citizen scientists. And um, also the visibility we have from for activities um, on the platform is uh, a short-term impact that we really um, like. <laughs> and then on the long-term, being part of a community and know that we can rely and address concerns and questions towards a whole range of experts and citizen science enthusiasts. That's, uh, yeah, from a really, that's a really high value for us. That's Thanks. great to hear and also great to hear that there might be further training models coming up. So that's yes. really interesting, I think, for all <laughs> participants. That's great. Thank you, Marie. Um, so um, just below me, I see Andrea. Hi. Hi. Yes, uh, as some of you already know, I think I had the, the fortune to be among the, the founders of EXA, of European Citizen Science Association, despite my association and my institution is quite a small one. It's a small natural history museum based in central Italy. This experience within EXA gave us the opportunity to uh, create a framework within Italy, and EU Citizen Science gave us the opportunity to strengthen this framework. 
And uh, the, the real new now is that we are seriously uh, speaking about creating a, an Italian citizen science association. So we already started working on it. And that was also thanks to the um, opportunity we had a couple of weeks ago with the EU citizen science and action projects. We organized an, a national citizen science conference in Italy and was a great success. So that gave us the opportunity to start with this new adventure. And so the, we had lots of new projects. The first one is to create the Citizen Science Association, and then maybe to create an Italian platform taking advantage from the EU Citizen Science platform. So within the, the EXA community, try to figure out this new feature also for Italy. That's great. Thank you, Andrea. And a uh, great job with uh, getting this community growing in Italy. Um, now, right in the middle of the screen, I see Alexandra from uh, the MNHN in Paris. Yes, um, I would like just to, to notice that uh, in France, too, the structuration, the institutionalization of the citizen science is quite uh, engaged. And uh, in our institution as a museum too, it's a um, subject that uh, is uh, quite settled. And, uh, but I totally agree with uh, Florian in the long-term impact. And I think that uh, what uh, the EU Citizen Science Project created is a real European community of actors involved in citizen science. And uh, it's that way, uh, I think that it will be the, the network uh, that network will be the point of reference uh, for the museum when we need, when we want to uh, exchange with professionals of other countries in the future to uh, settle new projects. I think that uh, we will turn uh, and see in that community uh, to, to seek for professionals, for actors to work with us. That's great. Thank you very much, Alexandra. Um, Belio, we are back in Estonia with you. Thanks. Yeah, it's interesting to, to look at the timeline of uh, EU citizen science project and what's happening in Estonia and what are the possible impacts. Right now I see that in Estonia there is kind of momentum where more and more researchers, organizations and stakeholders uh, will acknowledge the opportunities of citizen science. And I think, again, it's being a border country uh, that can explain this latency effect. And we have seen this kind of momentum in many other countries at a similar level of attention already five or ten years ago. Uh, but, yeah, during these last years, uh, many interesting things have happened. And I, I see the links to EU citizen science. So a couple of years ago, Estonian Citizen Science Union was founded by Estonian Naturalist uh, Society. And in previous year, uh, Estonian Environmental Agency started National Citizen Science Projects online uh, directory. And uh, there are many more initiatives happening right now. And uh, I would say that EU Citizen Science has helped to achieve a kind of more systematic approach to citizen science communication which is really important for us now, and uh, has set examples how to manage projects, uh, how to manage trainings, organize trainings, how to reach citizen scientists or uh, uh, how to approach policies. So uh, EU Citizen Science Portal has been a really good model for our national citizen science project portal and also helps to uh, push current, uh, current activism so uh, we have much clearer access to international cooperation and best practices. So, and I see that the Estonian projects already use the platform for, for promoting international level project. And, and I hope that will keep like this uh, in, in the future. And so we are on good track. Yeah, that sounds great. And yeah, let's hope that more and more will will use it in the future. Um, Kostas, uh, we are back to Greece with you. So I think that uh, following up what we discussed already previously, it's clear. Uh, if we were not part of this, we have been missing an important opportunity. And I must say, on behalf of young researchers working in our research group, especially for them uh, to, to get involved in citizen science activities, also 
uh, we would have missed the opportunity to get to know much better not only the European but also the Greek people working or some of the Greek people working in the field and we would have missed the opportunity to uh, start this important for us uh, activity for a hub on citizen science and there are quite a lot of other opportunities that we, we, we would have missed and of course we would have missed the portal whatever it, it has already brought uh, a, a thesaurus of, of uh, activities projects resources etc and uh, a unique opportunity of uh, online networking just to be brief that's great. yeah no that's perfect thank you costas it's really amazing we are almost on time um alex back to hungary what's uh, what do you see on the medium long term uh side yeah thank you marcia um yeah we see a couple of things uh, that um, really beneficial for us in long term uh, due to the project um i think i would say that essrg managed to develop uh, and reinforce its uh, expertise in the field of citizen science. So we also opened up opportunities for young researchers in the country and NGOs to take up the issue of citizen science and initiate project. Um, at local level, I would mention this. And at um, European level, as you also mentioned, uh, to strengthen the collaboration, I think it's uh, very important and we could uh, manage to also take more responsibility in other EU citizen science project. Right now we're part of uh, the UCAN project you might heard of, and uh, we find a lot of synergies that's going to be uh, very important for us in the future as well. Um, what we have learned in this project, we can uh, benefit it from in the UCAN as well. And the last one I would mention that we managed to co-develop and co-design a citizen science tool with local partners, mostly with NGOs. And of course, we uh, highly relied on the materials and, and expertise of the EU citizen science platform project. So without that, I think we would be a bit lost to, um, to start this co-designing process with local actors, especially those who uh, never really had experience in citizen science. So we had to provide training materials. And maybe the last one that uh, one of our partners uh, were brave enough to apply for the cascading grant. And we are very happy to say that one of the first Hungarian citizen science courses out there on the training models uh, platform. So we are very happy to, to share this uh, with our network in the future. That, that sounds you. absolutely great, Alex. Um, thank you very much. I, I, a huge thank you to all the speakers, especially for being so much on time. We, we are almost perfectly on time, which is pretty amazing considering the, the number of uh, people joining this panel. Um, I would really like to give a round of uh, virtual applause to all of you uh, for the huge engagement you have towards citizen science, the amazing uh, work you're doing uh, locally. And I'm sure that uh, participants um, can reach out to you if they're interested in knowing more about what you're doing locally, uh, both through this uh, platform, but also uh, through the EU Citizen Science uh, platform, which will uh, keep uh, being alive for hopefully a re really long time. And a big applause also to the project coordination team. I think uh, it really sounds like it has been an amazing experience. Uh, so thank you. And now um, I would like to invite all of you, please don't leave. We have a really nice uh, final session, uh, which is uh, going to take the format of a fishbowl. We are going to see how that works. Uh, we are not going to do it here on the stage. We are going to do it uh, in a session uh, because we really want to have you involved, all of you involved in it. Uh, this stage doesn't give the opportunity for participants to, to talk and interact. So we will be soon stop broadcasting from the stage. Uh, what we would like you to do is to click on uh, sessions and you will see a, a fishbowl, a session with title fishbowl happening uh, there. And uh, please don't be shy and uh, join us on the stage uh, during the discussion. So see you there in a few seconds.
Bye bye. Thank you. And here I am back on another virtual stage. <laughs> Online events almost give us the opportunity to be in multiple places at the same time. Uh, I'd like to uh, welcome the first fishes who are joining this fishbowl session with me today. Uh, you have already met with Antonella Passani and uh, Silke Voigtreute throughout the, 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 the sessions uh, these days. Uh, we also have with us uh, Dorte Riemenschneider, who is the Managing Director of the European Citizen Science Association. So welcome. Um, we are going to go through uh, a few points we would like to discuss today. Uh, the main focus is about the outlook into the future. Uh, so it's uh, really all about what is coming up next and how uh, we can collaborate, join forces and work together. Uh, and I see that uh, people are still very much enjoying emojis in the chat, which is really great. I'm really happy to see them. We don't have a warm-up activity for this session because the timing is really short, but please do keep posting uh, them in the chat. Um, so let's go straight into this. Uh, in this session, anyone can join the stage. So you just have to click on uh, join through audio and video. Uh, you can also join if you don't want to show your uh, your camera, if you don't want to activate your camera, you can also just activate the sound. Uh, but we would really love to hear uh, voices from participants. It's really the opportunity for uh, everyone to, to join. Um, but uh, to start with, uh, uh, we would really like to address one question uh, that is a quite challenging one, and Silke, Dorte, and Antonella have uh, agreed to, to, to address. Um, so we would like to talk together about what are the challenges that uh, citizen science is going to face uh, in the near future uh, mm. in its European evolution and eventually also at the local level. We just heard about a lot of really interesting uh, local challenges. Uh, in this case, I will uh, follow again the order uh, of what I see in the screen. And right next to me is Silke. So welcome, Silke. Hi, Marcia. Uh, yeah, really nice to be here. Uh, a really hot topic. What are the challenges of citizen science? I think I've already shared that uh, in the chat. Um, I was super happy yesterday to read um, that the new German government um, actually promised, um, they said they will integrate citizen science more strongly into research agendas across Germany and research funding. So that's great news, but funding is one part, really having it um, systematically integrated into science system mainstream throughout the educational system. I think that's a huge, huge, huge challenge and also acceptance of academia of citizen science. Um, from my experience, I think um, there is a great interest in citizen science, in particular in some disciplines, but at the same time, there remains still skepticism about um, the big questions, quality of data, um, the efficiency of citizen science as a research approach. And I think we have to very much um, advocate for citizen science and work um, to overcome those, in my view, prejudices. Um, and for this, I think one really essential thing that we have to do apart from lobbying um, within projects, um, we have to be more loud and more outspoken and here to speak at the right places. And this, I wonder whether we can uh, make this uh, uh, part of the discussion. Where do we raise our voice when our voice is limited in time and uh, resources? Yeah, that's a really good point. Thank you, Silke. And uh, I, it would be great if we keep joining forces all together in the future to make these voices uh, heard. Um, Dorte, uh, welcome, and we really look forward to hear your points of view as, of course, also as the European Citizen Science uh, Association. We don't hear you, Dorte. I don't know what's happening. <laughs> uh, maybe while you check what's happening with the sounds, uh, it's strange because it looks green there are these three green dots so it should be working but uh, we can't hear you maybe in the meantime we can go to antonella while you figure it out 
Yeah, sure. Um, I think that uh, the main challenge will be now that citizen science is seen uh, as um, mainstreaming in other sector to do not lost uh, what we achieved in the last years, which is for me uh, a big call to participation and to inclusivity. So to be, uh, we know that citizen science is a spectrum uh, and citizens can be engaged in different stages of, of the research uh, process. But I think that we really need to push to consider citizens not as human censors, but as uh, entitled to influence the research agenda and to evaluate the project and to be engaged in policy design and policy monitoring and evaluation. So really, uh, I think one of the challenge will be to uh, be sure that when we have and we put citizen science in innovation program all around the sectors, we really push for inclusivity and, uh, um, and participation. And also about inclusivity, um, it's, it's not for us, it's not only a matter of having uh, gender balance uh, or um, people from different cultural background involved uh, in uh, citizen science, which of course are, are super important things. But um, the, the challenge for me will be to engage those that are not already engaged in science those that do not believe in science, that's those that do not uh, buy the, the call for uh, transformation uh, and for behavioral change for a more uh, sustainable future. So reach out to, uh, to those people and find a way of make citizen science for all. I think this will be, um, will be a call. And the last of the third challenge will be to as Silke, I, I, as Silke pointed out, be um, recognized at policy level by policymakers. And this is a, a two-way communication effort that needs to be, to be done, of course, and in, in the academia. So um, pushing for extreme citizen science at the same time, so find a way to be uh, trustworthy and to be listened and to be a point of reference, a, a trustable point of reference. Yes, yeah, good point. Um, thank you, Antonella. Dörte, shall we give it a try? Nope, <laughs> I still don't hear you. Um, maybe in the meantime, I see there are lots of fishes waiting to join our fishbowl. So let me uh, welcome more fishes to the stage. Thank you very much for not being shy and joining us today. We are quite a few, so I'm sure we are going to have a really interesting conversation. I have prepared a few questions that uh, I would like to uh, ask, uh, but I'm sure that you also have plenty of things uh, to share. Uh, we are talking about the future of uh, citizen science, both uh, at European level, at on a more local level, uh, and uh, opportunities we see, challenges we see. Um, uh, I would like maybe to give the floor to start with to uh, Francisco. So Fran is actually the person uh, behind the EU citizen science platform in the sense of its technical development. Welcome also to Maria. Uh, and uh, he has been the person coding and, and building uh, uh, the platform since its very first uh, release uh, up to now. Uh, so welcome, Fran. And what are your thoughts? You're joining us from Spain today. Yeah, thank you very much, Martia. Yeah, let me say something about the future of citizen science that uh, yeah, I think that we have a very, very good future. But something I think that we need to be careful is not to do all the effort in research about, about how to do citizen science. Uh, I mean, without putting all this knowledge in practice uh, and do a lot of projects with real impact, uh, scientific impact, policy impact, and so on. I think that for this reason, I like very much the approach of the European Commission that, that uh, thinks citizen science as a transversal Inside open science, things citizen science as a traversal issue in, inside all the horizon Europe uh, calls. So, yeah, and for me, another important thing uh, that maybe we are missing is also to promote bottom up projects 
that we are, we are doing that for sure, but to promote also bottom-up topics that I think that we, we are pushing to, to, to have a bottom-up project, but uh, I think that the topics of the project are, are very close. So I think that we need to do a lot, uh, uh, an effort there to, to, to promote other topics. And that, this is our, more or less my view in the future and the things that uh, we, in, in our series, we are, we, are, yeah, we are working on to, to, to solve these two things. Yeah, I cannot hear you, Marcia. Yeah. Still, I'm not unmuting myself. This will <laughs> never stop happening. Thank you, Fran. Uh, no, I was saying thank you. These are really two important points. Um, I, I'm really happy so many fishers uh, have joined, and I really uh, would like to invite more people can 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 still join if you want at any time. You don't need to wait for my invitation. I see two new persons that have not. Uh, given any presentation yet in, in this event. And uh, I know they have also some really interesting uh, things to share from, from their countries. Uh, so I would like to uh, welcome for, uh, Maria Vicente. And uh, I know you are in between Portugal and the Netherlands. So welcome, Maria. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I'm actually now in Portugal. And today we're actually hosting the National Citizen Science uh, Conference. And it's quite interesting because also linking to what you were mentioning, uh, Marcia, we actually did today, it's happening in eight different places at the same time and we are doing it in, in, in public libraries with a common program. So, but at the same, and in, in public libraries, but also in university libraries. So it's quite interesting We feel that the challenges are, are quite different and have different levels of, of involvement. On one hand, you feel that we try to talk about citizen science, but there's still a problem of science, of science communication. So um, there's this culture of having science in the daily life is still um, an issue. So it's not still part, part of the culture uh, and the, the dialogues that exist. And then, at, of course, at the university level and in Portugal, um, institutionally, there's no support for citizen science at university. So it's it's so. So on one hand, what I'm trying to say is that there's a, a wide um, um, movement that needs to be done at the, at the citizen level of making this more mainstream in terms of science being more part of the, of the, of the daily processes. And then from the research component, uh, from the academia, there needs to be an institutional uh, effort that doesn't happen yet. And then I feel also that even in the projects that we are doing, in, I speak for myself, the projects that we develop at the Open Science Hub, is that we are able oftentimes to involve the citizens, the community, but by the end of the day, we also want to create knowledge, scientific knowledge, and reliable and systematic. And oftentimes, these two sides of the coin, the citizen involvement and creating um, rigorous uh, scientific uh, knowledge is not, is, is, is not straightforward. Um, so this are just two cents. Yeah, no, thank you. All, all your contributions are extremely interesting and I really love how there are also very interesting connections between them. Um, I see a new guest joining. So uh, welcome, Gaston. Uh, maybe you can just briefly introduce yourself and uh, share your thoughts with us. Oh, thank you, Marcia. Uh, <clears throat> Well, Hassan Remmers, I'm from the Netherlands. Um, I have a long history in working in participatory regional development, but for the past eight years, due to several medical issues, I became a patient advocate in the healthcare sector and working, dedicating myself now to leveraging citizen science and health. Um, well, to this session, <clears throat> what I would like to contribute is that I... Uh, on the one hand, I'm, I'm so happy to see that at the European level, citizen science is, in, is in being increasingly incorporated in all kinds of policies and research outlines, which is a bit in contrast with, with what I see happening in the Netherlands, in which there's kind of lip service happening, but not really, really taking the steps to, to really incorporate it, as from a patient perspective, at least in the health domain we see. It's quite a difficult situation that we are facing and we have to struggle a bit. Um, so given the, the, on the one hand, 
the fact that the European Union is doing uh, giving a great example on this. I would say it can also, um, the, the biggest fear I have is that we underestimate the potential of citizen science. And what I mean by that is that I see that citizen science is uh, capable of delivering just that, that enables us to navigate between tendencies of totalitarianism on the one hand and complete um, egalitarianism, uh, every can, everybody can have a say uh, type of uh, societies. So. Uh, I think it cannot be underestimated that in this society in which all kinds of political decisions are science-based, anything that is science-based is also automatically political. So if we have the capacity to see that and to, 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 to uh, raise the bar and the importance of citizen science to the level that it's a core thing of the European Union to develop, uh, then we're getting somewhere, I guess. And that may dynamize all kinds of new kind of uh, social interactions um, that may help to overcome the divide and the polarization that I was having a chat on with Andreas and, uh, and uh, uh, I forgot his name, Linden uh, in the other chat. So that will be my, my, my mistake on it. Yeah, thank, thank you. you very much, Gaston, and thank you for speaking up about this also, sharing your personal experience. I think it's really, uh, really important uh, what you say um, and also sharing your, your really hands-on experience on this. Uh, definitely there would be, I think, any form of citizen engagement uh, really helps, can really help, especially to get through, to navigate through the, the time we are living, which is particularly uh, complex. Um, this also connects to the Another question that I really would have liked to uh, I would, would like to ask to to participants as and as I mentioned before, I see lots of uh, people in in the session, so don't hesitate uh, to follow our the example from our brave fishes and and join us on the stage. You just need to activate your at least your microphone, uh, but also your camera if you wish to do so. Uh, is also what has changed for you? more on a personal level in your personal experiences, personal and professional, of course, experiences, uh, since uh, there is in a way a growing popularity for citizen science that we have been seeing. There is definitely a positive uh, effect to it, as, as Gaston was mentioning, and as many of you has been uh, mentioning uh, through uh, democratizing processes, etc. But um, I saw it, uh, in the chat before, I don't remember who wrote this, uh, there is also maybe a danger that it could in a way become also a bug fixing uh, exercise sometimes to say, okay, we have done some citizen engagement. So uh, I know you have been, many of you have been involved in, in, in citizen science or citizen engagement at large since a long time. So maybe in, also additionally to your thoughts on the future, uh, of citizen science, it would be really interesting also to hear what has been an impact for, for you in, in, in your work or uh, on your professional activities uh, and your institution, this growing, growing interest of uh, citizen science. Um, and I see Barbara and Costas are with us also. Uh, so maybe Barbara, would you like to, to go first? Uh, thank you very much, much, Marcia. Yes, I mean, actually, for, uh, for me or for our institution, it has been quite um, interesting and, of course, beneficial seeing this change to more participatory research. I mean, our center has um, been established uh, like over 25 years ago or so, working on social innovation when nobody was ever using that word or so. And uh, our uh, then our, our director, uh, our scientific director, was constantly, you know, um, talking about it, promoting it, showing the importance of it. And just now, you know, even in the in these policy programs and everywhere, we see how how important it has become. It is related to, of course, due to uh, integrating also uh, citizens into research. So it is part, I would say, also of a, a, a social and a social innovation. Uh, process. So for us, it has been uh, super beneficial, and we have had also gained a lot of vis vis visibility. I would say with the topics that we have been discussing or studying already before, and trying to 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 raise more awareness of it. And on the other hand, 
I see a little bit also of the danger of what I have observed over all these years, um, following also the, the big funding schemes in Europe, that we do have trend, trend to have trends there. And we go also in kind of waves. And I just hope that we can make sure that this uh, participatory approaches and, and, for example, open science, citizen science, is not just a trend. And, and in the next framework programs, we again will, will see something else or, you know, going to different ways again. So I think it's also on us to make sure that this is, is not just a trend, but it is, you know, really what, uh, what, what we think, you know, it is and how beneficial it can be for our uh, societies. So, yeah, just end it with this. <laughs> Yeah, that's a, a really important point. I see many hands raised. I just wanted to give the opportunity to Costa, since he has been quite for some time in in the fishbowl with us, to to talk first, and then I'll 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 keep going. I see new fishes joining, so thank you very much for being on the stage with us, Costas. So thanks again for this opportunity. I think that we have here a, a unique setup of people uh, coming from completely different, let's say, areas of uh, theoretical and applied research. And uh, citizen science seems to be a, a mess that can connect everybody, but on the other hand, seems to be a, a challenge for everybody because it's been understood, interpreted, and I'm, I'm putting in now my personal approach, of course, in a different way. So well, allow me to elaborate a little bit more. As I have uh, discussed with some of you in the past during project meetings, I have the view of a classic orthogonal engineer. I'm an engineer. So if it cannot be proven, if it is solid, if it is not solid state, if it's not mathematically grounded, it's not true for me, whatever it is. I'm not reflecting my personal approach. I'm reflecting the approach of the students that I'm training. This is how we are training engineers all over Europe. So in order for uh, I believe that in order to um, uh, achieve viability and sustainability for citizen science, we need to integrate it into education and especially university education, because university people will be the ones that will make decisions in the next step, as, either as educators or scientists or whatever. And in order to do so, we need to make it crystal, crystal clear for each scientific domain what citizen science is and what can bring in and which are the limitations. I think that this can be an important practical, let's say, working group basis, even for EXA uh, task. So, for instance, you know, you go to your uh, medical doctor. Would you accept a citizen science approach in your treatment? If you are ill, Yes, no, under which circumstances, as a patient, not as a doctor. So in order to allow this question to have a meaning, we need to see what's there for medical doctors, what's there for engineers, for sociologists, for those educating people on, on a little, uh, uh, young children, which are very sensitive to that. So for a very big spectrum of people, yeah. to make it crystal clear, not to make it a buzzword as very well already uh, suggested by um, my colleagues previously, because now it's a trend. Okay, and we uh, all uh, heard uh, Patrick Bernier yesterday saying that, you know, people in the next call, there's going to be societal en engagement and some criteria of proposals. Okay, that's good. But at the end of the day, what's there really? I mean, would this promote a really understanding of science in everyday life? Would it democratize science where it should be democratized? And would it also bring into the surface the limitations? Decisions need to be made, crucial decisions at the end of the day, by those that know what the stake is. We yeah. know that there are hidden opportunities out there, so many hidden opportunities for citizen science. Uh, I think that we should, you know, pinpoint them, prioritize them, create a working list on it, 
update it continuously. So that's my... It sounds the, like a great plan for the steps to come uh, in the, well, the activities that will keep going on after the, the projects are over. And if I may add uh, to the list you mentioned, so going back to the example of the doctor that you mentioned, so what is in there for the doctor, what is in there for the research community, but also what is in there for the patients uh, to, to share this data. So I think there are some really good questions that you have uh, raised. Thank you very much, Costas, for sharing. And I would like to jump straight to Claire because I think uh, ethical issues <laughs> are something that are really uh, important to you. But also maybe you're also coming to the rescue of, uh, I know Dorte, I don't see Dorte anymore. I don't know she has managed to connect again. Mm. So maybe I know you're also with the European Citizen Science Association. So maybe you are coming to the rescue on that. I am. And I think I have a minute to try and address everything which is an enormous task it's okay so we can go on with this session until twelve forty, so we still have some okay. time no rush okay good um well just to kind of work backwards very quickly one is uh, for costas i would strongly encourage him to actually approach the um, education working group in exa because that is exactly their remit those are exactly the things that they care about and they want to cover so you know and, and kind of then going on backwards to what Barbara was saying, you know, the whole point of EXA is that we are there to bring all of European citizen science people together. So, you know, if we actually come together, we can make more of an impact rather than, you know, it's, it's much harder for one person to stand there and say, we should have education in citizen science. That's a lot harder to do. Whereas if you come together and unite, it becomes a lot easier. You can share experiences, resources, everything. So I would strongly say that, you know, first of all, Costas approach the education people because the education working group and I'll try and put the link in the chat when I'm finished talking and um, but also with Barbara's point I think there are going to be more opportunities for citizen science and that's really exciting we're so excited about this but I think it also does raise questions in the community that maybe we should you know keep exploring maybe through EU citizen science platform opportunities to share resources to share ways of working well you know to to make it easier for our colleagues who are not experienced in citizen science to get in because you know we don't want to be gatekeepers we want to open the doors to everyone but we want to do it in a way that we can be sure that they have the support they need and that they can deliver good science um, and then if i come back to ethics <laughs> in, in some random order it's just for me personally been really interesting because when you know we're doing an extreme citizen science approach which means at the very start we know very little about what we're doing and how it's going to be shaped. And if you ask for engagement, especially, you know, in our case, health, teenagers, you, it means you're doing multiple rounds of ethical inquiries and ethical discussions, and you're doing them in four different countries. So your problem is multiplied by four. Um, and I think it's just something that we need to bear in mind. So when you're doing, say, health types of citizen science, you know, you need to be very clear what the data is. How are you using it? How do you expect people to use it? How are they going to engage with it afterwards? How is it going to be available? Blah, blah, blah. And that just probably needs to be factored in in a concept of time within the project, because it's probably going to take a lot longer than you realized. And varying countries have various ways of approaching ethics. And I, I don't know if there's a solution, like an easier way of dealing with this, but it was just something I think that was a lot more time consuming than we first realized when we started the project. Yeah, thank you, Clara, for addressing so many points in such a short time. That was great. Thanks. Um, I see one more fish in our fishbowl. That's great to welcome Kat Austin also. And if I'm not wrong, you're also joining us from Berlin. Yeah, that's right. Hello from Berlin. Um, and yes, I'm the accelerator lead for the action um, project. And I mean, oh, there's, everyone's, everyone's covered a lot of the points that I would uh, already um, have talked about. I suppose, um, you know, from my perspective, or engaging in citizen science as a form of uh, knowledge making is a transformational experience for everybody involved, um, the citizen scientists particularly. Uh, and I think, I mean, from what we've seen through the accelerator uh, and from my own experience running projects, there are um, unspoken lists of priorities when, when one starts a project. And this is something that is um, going to become more of a, 
more of an issue as more people who have less experience are starting projects as, as citizen science kind of grows and becomes uh, a, uh, an integral part of how research is done. And so it's a, let's say, an opportunity at the moment to make sure that the things that are not considered integral um, to a project success are going to be considered at the start of a project. And those are things like uh, inclusion, um, rigorous of scientific methods, actually making things match up so that the, the findings are robust and helpful uh, where possible. And being aware of the inherent power dynamics when projects are being set up. Um, so, I mean, you know, obviously things like stakeholder mapping can help with that, but it's also about having the awareness and attitude when you're running the project or um, engaging with other stakeholders. Um, so it's now, I think, the, the time that we can really sort of push for some of these things, ethics, safeguarding, things that don't appear to be the crucial bottom line of the project um, if you are coming to it you know without uh, without having run a project before and you want to gather data on you know changing rainfall patterns or whatever um, these are the things that it would be great if we're sort of making sure that these best practices are at the front now um, and similarly I think equally important is thinking about how citizen science uh, and different types of citizen science are positioned within the participatory research landscape and how there are synergies with other forms of participatory research um, and other types of learning that can be shared. So also keeping that sort of network open to look at how things are being done with other types of research methods beyond citizen science. Um, will help us identify and position citizen science in broader cultural trends, which is very, very important because finally, I would say, you know, we have difficult societal problems regarding expertise um, and giving authority to knowledge and citizen science can be instrumental in changing how this is thought of. So rather than thinking about um, I can do research and therefore I know everything. We can say, I can do research, look at how much I've learned. Other people also do this and know a lot. And we open the conversation there instead of closing it down and reconfigure re how expertise is, is being understood and being talked about. Mm. Thank you, Kat. I think this is a great takeaway message. I see applause going on, yes. Uh, and I think it also summarizes really nicely the whole conference we have had in these two days. I think uh, it's... Um, so thank you for doing my job. I think we can, you know, I'm joking. Uh, I think it's a really great point because uh, it's still... I would say it's still okay to, I mean, if you go for the first time into citizen science or even not for the first time, it's still okay to learn. It's a learn by doing process. It's still okay to not get things uh, right uh, straight away or to evolve over time. Uh, but definitely if we look at your citizen science in action, there is a huge richness of uh, know-how that is being shared there. So I think uh, for all the participants joining us that. Uh, are still uh, learning, and I think we could say this for all of us uh, in the uh, citizen science activities. It's really good, really good point to uh, to go and uh, profit from this huge amount of knowledge that is available there, but also to share. And I think both platforms are a great place, and especially in the U Citizen Science platform, there are specific sessions, there is a forum and session where. Uh, people can exchange and, and keep learning from each other. I think this is really one of the main great takeaway messages uh, that uh, we, can, we can hear from these two days of uh, conference. 
Um, we still have two minutes left, and I think maybe I don't know if it was uh, the case, but I think Antonella, at a certain point, you had raised your hand. Maybe I'm mistaken, but uh, I don't know if there was anything you wanted to add before we wrap up. No, no, um, uh, it, it was quite time ago. We I know, about, <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> no, 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 but it, it's super okay because it's, I think it can also be a nice closure. <clears throat> the fact that uh, in European uh, funds or in national funds, there are these bots that, that change from a program to another. So uh, also in my experience, I've always been working and across disciplines in having user-centered research and innovation, let's say, if we want to call this level. But we got social innovation, we got digital social innovation, we got co-design, we got participation, and now we got citizen science. I think that if we keep focus on the necessity um, of having citizens involved and participating in, in changing our society, uh, also through science, then it doesn't matter if the, the bads were changed, uh, if we keep an eye on the need to build bridges between communities and different way of produce and large standardize and communicate knowledge and learnings. Yeah, yeah, that sounds like also really nice uh, wrap up uh, of all this discussion. Before we close, I just wanted to mention what the Silke as also a, a coordinator for you citizen science, if you have any uh, comments you would like to add on this. I think we have raised so many interesting points and there is also a lot of uh, interesting discussion going on in the chat, which I'm eager to read as soon as this session is over, too many things at the same time. So thank you also to all the participants who didn't come to the stage but kept the uh, chat very uh, lively. So uh, Silke, it's up to you. It's not <laughs> um, in case you'd like to... Uh, close up uh, this conversation with us. Thank you, Marcia. Uh, that comes a bit of a surprise. Uh, did we? Did we? Uh, did we uh, agree on that? We did. No, 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 no. We didn't. We, you don't have to. I'm no, sorry. I'm really, I just... happy, I'm really happy to do so. Um, uh, I just want to say how much I appreciate um, that we are so open and collaborative uh, in EU citizen science, but beyond in citizen science project. I think that's the true strength of citizen science and that we um, should live up to the examples that we put forward in our projects um, to be co-creative, uh, sharing data, being open and also fair, um, not only regarding data, but also our inclusiveness and diversity within projects. And um, I think we really should unite uh, to push forward our, um, uh, our approaches and issues and um, use as we have already mentioned in the chat, um, all the um, uh, very helpful EXA working groups um, to get our voice heard. Because I think these working groups are a really good place uh, to do so. And EXA is uh, the place with EU citizen science as a platform in future um, to um, unite us and um, together our voice is louder and we are stronger. And um, I'm really happy about this conference and I hope it helps to shape a brilliant and bright future for citizen science in Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Silke, and apologies for the <laughs> improvising. Um, I think we are almost about to wrap up, and I would like to call a few people back to the stage. Okay, Michael, great. You can read my mind. You're already back. So my co-host, Michael. And if you feel like, uh, of course, you're all more than welcome to stay on the stage, but I wanted to say whether also Antonella Radicchi and Claudia Fabocartas, I know this was also not planned, but in case you would like to show up, I'm full of surprises. Yes, uh, you can come to the stage because I would really like for everyone to give you a huge round of applause. Uh, Antonella Passani, Antonella Radicchi and, and Claudia have been uh, at the core of the organization of this uh, conference. Uh, we have done an amazing job. It has been a pleasure working together with you on, on this. And I think that I see also Antonella coming. So Elena, Elena, I see. call also Elena. Elena, please join. Uh, I know that you're all there somewhere. Uh, <laughs> so I think it's a really well-deserved moment to get some uh, a, a, a huge applause for, for the huge effort 
you have put in in the organization of uh, of this event, which uh, I hope uh, participants have uh, very much enjoyed. Uh, and thank you also to Dort. I'm really sorry you were not able to join uh, to make your sound work, but uh, I'm sure that uh, you were able to share your thoughts uh, through the chat. So thank you very much. We're again two minutes ahead of schedule, so I think this is also a good thing. Uh, we are finishing uh, perfectly, almost perfectly on time this okay. conference. Please don't forget. Yes, Michael, go ahead. I was going to say, just a reminder to please uh, fill out a feedback form. I'm posting it uh, just now in the chat. Um, we really appreciate uh, all your feedback. It really helps us uh, in organizing future events like this. But yeah, a big thanks to everyone for joining us yes and not uh, don't do not forget that this afternoon from two to four i know antonella you are going to say <laughs> that uh there is a very important interesting event is uh, a, a master class slash high policy event uh very focused on policy recommendations so uh, please uh do join uh you don't need if you're registered to the conference in general anyone can can join the event and there are lots of really nice activities uh, planned there. It's happening still here on the same, hoping it will start on the stage and then there will be uh, sessions, several sessions uh, slash breakout rooms where you can um, uh, interact directly and, and work together with some of uh, the project partners. So thank you very much. Thank you for having stayed with us, spent time with us uh, these two days. And we, I think we all hope to, to see you again soon. Thank you, bye-bye. And I would really like to say thank you, Marcia, thank you, Michael, thank you, Maria, in the background uh, for the brilliant organization. Uh, it was a pleasure working with you, and um, I think uh, you did a wonderful job in bringing us all together. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Indeed. Have a nice rest of the day. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye-bye.